everyone, Lynn Smith here, and welcome to Stroller Coaster, the podcast that takes you on the wild ride of parenting that we're all on together, created by Munchkin. No wonder the most loved baby brand in the world. Justin, hi. Can you believe this is the last episode of season three? What a ride. We talk about being on a ride, and it's, <sighs> it's wild that this ride is coming to a temporary end. Yes, and I'm just really excited to reflect back on this season, and we're going to share why it was so special. But before we start, I want to take a moment to tell our listeners about this really beautiful event that I recently hosted, and Munchkin participated as well. So Operation Shower is an organization that hosts baby showers for military families, because of course, these are families often apart. So their mission is to ease the stresses of deployment and separation Mm -hmm. and bring joy to the families. And so I went to a shower in South Carolina, and let me tell you, Justin, and the joy was overwhelming to see. And we we played some trivia games. Of course, it's a baby shower, so we had to do that. <laughs> you got to do trivia. And we included some of the really valuable information that we gathered during Stroller Coaster Season 3. So I'm really excited that in today's episode, we're going to look back on some of the things that we learned, some of the things we tried that worked, what didn't work, and really share some big takeaways for each of us. It's my favorite episode we do each season because we get to talk about it from a very personal point of view. So let's get into it. Let's start with big emotions. If you've been listening to this podcast for the last few seasons, you know I am very open about big emotions exist in our house, and I'm very challenged as a parent to manage that. So this really spoke to me. Take a listen from the episode. When your kids are having tantrums in public, it's really hard, and you feel judged, and you feel as though there's something about your kid's behavior that reflects on you and your skill as a parent. Your child's behavior at Target is not a reflection of who they are as a child or who you are as a parent, but it's really hard to remember that. Parents become much more invested in what I call impression management, managing other people's impression of them as a parent than they are in actually parenting the way that feels good to them. Uh, It's a great lesson. And as parents, we're constantly parenting in public or in front of other parents. So I feel like this takeaway is so good. I'll just give you an example of something that I did a little bit differently because of the advice that was given in this episode. I was with my son at a drugstore and and he wanted a toy. And I was like, we're not here Mm. for a toy. You know, how many times have we done this, right? Target, you you insert (laughs) any location. They just want a toy wherever you go. We're not here for a toy. He's just a mess on the floor, screaming. All of this instantly, my my previous parenting self is feeling the eyeballs in the back of my head of like, what kind of parent are you? Your kid has a meltdown in the middle of a store because you won't get him a toy. And that's really what spoke to me in this episode, that mm. it doesn't matter what all of those eyeballs are seeing. It matters how you connect with your child in that moment because they need you. This is like a, think of it as a cry for help. So instead... I got down to his level, and I looked him in the eye, and I just said, you seem so upset. Not, you shouldn't be asking for this, and you don't need a toy. Not not negotiating, but just, you seem so upset. And I gave him this really big hug and just held him. And I could feel his body, like, sort of releasing some of the tension that he had. And I realized, this is what this episode was all about. If you just get down on their level and you realize that this isn't something to – scold them on. It's something to be curious about, like, what's going on? And you can do this at any age. You can give a hug at any age. Try <laughs> this at home. I guarantee you it will work. And I love that we we also dug into that feeling of how embarrassing it is in public. My daughter just turned seven. We had a big birthday mm-hmm. party. Parents and kids run around. It's chaotic. It's a hotbed of parental eyeballs. So like, yeah. Uh, you had to really hold tight to these lessons and be like, you know what? It, it's fine. It's okay. Let's just talk this through. You're upset. No problem. There are 50 balloons over there. I know this It's not the pink one that's right there, but that blue one looks pretty good too, right? <laughs> like finding those ways to just calmly move through it rather than – it's a panic. When you see all those other eyes on you, you know, as a parent, you start to panic. But it's on us to hold on to our emotions in those moments. And when you listen to this episode, you're going to walk away knowing that the misbehavior of your kids is actually stressed behavior. They're not acting out because they want to be bad. They're acting out because they need something from us. So it's really changed a lot for us. I hope everyone listening gets a moment to really dig deep into this episode. 
So, Lynn, I want to talk about our episode about playing outside and mm. physical activity being so important to kids. Some episodes we do, it's about taking in some tactics to deal with certain situations. But some episodes, I'm just blown away by <laughs> a pure piece of information that I never thought of before. So let's play the clip and we'll talk about it after. Inside the inner ear are little hair cells. And when we move in rapid ways, it moves the fluid back and forth and develops what we call the vestibular sense. When babies are first born, that vestibular sense is actually fully functioning. It's not like the visual sense where they see in black and white. However, if you take that baby and you keep them upright and you put them in containers and put them in the stroller and then you put them in the car seat and you just don't allow them time to play and move around on the ground, then inside the inner ear, that fluid can thicken and they can start to have ear infections. They can start to have trouble integrating the reflexes and that system won't um, be as strong as it should be to support all different skills such as being able to know where their body is in space and be safer and more capable in their environment. I mean, you believe that, Lynn? The inner ear? Like, ever since I heard this, I've been taking my kids, flipping them upside down. I'm like, let's get that inner <laughs> ear covered. we got to <laughs> do more so that you can have this balance and have these things happen in your body that you need. Something else I've noticed is I now take the time to appreciate when I see them enjoying nature. So, you know, we live by the water and we oftentimes are just outside, no toys, taking a stick, just digging in the sand. And now that I've listened to this episode and heard all of the incredible benefits of it, I just sit and watch and I find a new joy in that. Of course, I've always loved to see them play and be outside, but there's this new joy in what I know they're getting out of something like this. So it's almost enhanced for me living in the moment with my children as well. Well, and another takeaway from the episode is just how much time kids need to be mm, outside and play. Definitely. And, and you know, we I live in a city, so we have to really push a little bit to get that outside. And this summer we're going upstate where I'm from and we've already planned, my wife is leading this immersion. Like we're gonna get out there and be like, so here's here are plants you can eat. We're going full wilderness. And that's all been inspired by this episode. And the exposure to new sensations, right? We got permission in this episode, yeah. like put your kids in the puddle, put yeah. them in the mud, dig get with muddy. your hands. Those sensations are developing their brain. So this is not a take your kids off of screen time type episode. This is really, you're going to get excited about getting outside and playing. Oh, I loved this episode about kindness. First and foremost, you will walk away from this episode absolutely falling in love with Leon. <laughs> Leon Logopedis <laughs> is the expert in this episode who's doing incredible things. And he shares with us about the experience of kindness. It, mm. He calls it a felt experience and what it does for our children. And it's really about the connection that they make. Take a listen to the episode and what Leon has to say. When you can inspire a child to connect with another child, it changes the DNA, the cells of that kid, because that kid all of a sudden feels like they have value. They're good at something. They are in in inspiring. They are funny. They, they gain confidence by that human connection. So I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle. That gave me such a deeper meaning to why I want to obviously teach my child kindness, but also to show them the experience that they have when they are kind and what that connection can do, the ripple effect of what that connection is. And now when I'm talking to my child about being kind, it's not just be kind at school, it's what did you do to be kind for somebody and how did that make you feel? And what did it make the other person feel like? And what did that connection feel like? It's a whole conversation now rather than just we want to be kind to people. It almost paints the picture for them of what impact they're making. So when I ask those questions, it's not like they are mature enough to be able to articulate it, but you can see it. it you can see their face kind of light up with pride and joy that they know that they've made a positive impact. Sometimes with parenting, you just feel it when you see it in their face. Yeah. If you think about it on the surface, kindness is something that you're like, oh, I'm just helping someone out for a second. 
But really, that's what I, I loved about what Leon said is it's a bond you're creating and you're pulling each other up in that way. You get a benefit from being kind as much as mm-hmm. the person who is feeling that kindness gets the benefits. Especially now when I feel like we as people are connected less than ever before, yeah. that kindness is even more important to make those connections. Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine if everyone just took one small step in the tips that Leon shares in this episode, how different our society would be. Because of this episode, there's one thing that my wife and I have been doing with our older daughter, talking about making sure everyone feels included, like on the playground. My wife and I both, you know, grew up, and I think we both felt like, you know, it's never great when you feel like you're on the outside in a playground situation, in any sort of situation like that. So one thing we're really imparting on our kids is like, if you see a kid who's who's feeling left out, go grab them, bring them in. And our older daughter, it's like she's become sort of the mayor of the playground after school because she's always cycling through and being like, hey, go, you come over here. Let's do this. We're running around. So it seems like a small thing, but I think it is sort of in that that connective kindness uh, realm that we've been talking about. Mm. So I want to talk about this episode we did about reading. We had Dr. David Pearson, who spent his entire life working on getting kids to read more. Yeah, and he had incredible. so many great ideas that that take a little bit of the pressure off. At least for me, it took a lot of the pressure off, like the 20 minutes of reading we do with my older daughter every day. It doesn't have to be all end all in that 20 minutes. Reading is a lifelong journey. I don't want to spoil the clip, so let's mm-hmm. play the clip and we'll talk in a sec. I have some colleagues who like to make a distinction between learning to read and reading to learn. And Mm. the idea is, is that, well, you spend the first few years of in school learning to read. And then once you get pretty good at it, then you can read to learn. It's not a distinction that I like. I think kids are always reading to learn, even when a parent, a grandparent, sibling, a tutor is reading to them. They want to know what's inside that book. Conversely, I'll be 82 in two months, and I think I still have a lot to learn, not only about the world, but about reading. And I hope I'm still learning to read for another couple of decades. It changes kids' awareness of what reading is when it's something that is just a a constant in their lives. Many of the takeaways that we've been talking about with these episodes are new ways that we communicate some of the challenges we face with children. But in this episode, it was really kind of suggested, use the book as that conversation point. Let them see themselves through the character and maybe prompt some questions through that. It allows them to be maybe a little bit more vulnerable than they would be before because it's not all about them. They may be relating it to the book itself. So we've tried that and I've seen Mm. it. My sons are really more open to talking about something if I point out in the book and then they are able to respond and have more critical thinking than if you're just trying to do that in real time. Yeah, same. It's trusting them to recognize the behavior in the book and themselves and be like, oh, I see. That's what, Mm -hmm. that isn't nice. And when I do that, that's how it feels to the other person. That's the power of shifting the dynamic into the characters in the book. And one other thing, Dr. Pearson talks about the skill, will, and thrill associated Mm. with reading. You need all three. You need the skill of reading, the will, the desire to go read, but also the thrill. I've been really working on the thrill at home, where I'm like, ah, oh, this book, I read this when I was a kid, changed my life. Uh, we're about to start reading the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe books mm, uh, by yes. C.S. Lewis and the Voyage of the Don Treaders, the third one about they go inside a painting. I was like, I've spent years in my life imagining going inside paintings. So like, I want to read this to you and have you read it to me so that you can have that same sense of magic. <laughs> How to Raise Confident Kids. What a great and important episode I went into knowing that I needed this. Suzanne Brown is our expert, and I struggle with this because my kids play sports. They're very, very competitive and get so down on themselves if they lose. And so I always was trying to understand how do I teach them that it's okay to not be good at everything. Actually, a confident person knows that they don't need to be good at everything. Here's what she had to say about some of these things. Take a listen. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes progress. And mm. being able to to share that with your child and not say, 
oh, look, you made 10 baskets at the basketball game. But it was, I saw you running so hard. You were doing so well with passing. And that was exactly what your coach was trying to to teach you. You're giving them the confidence in building the skills and not not having essentially like your love attached to, look at how many baskets you made, or you made first chair for violin. You're giving them that permission to try new things out, to say, you know, I love this. I'm not that good at it, but does that even matter? (laughs) That's the thing. Does it even matter? No, it doesn't. And so I started to share with my boys when I didn't win, when I failed. Uh. And actually, my son said to me before his baseball game the other day, he goes, I'm going to lose the game tonight. And I was like, well, that's, I, I go, well, let's, let's be positive, confident. right? Yeah. But, well, it's like, let's be positive. And he said, no, you told me it was good to fail. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm trying to, how do I articulate? It's okay to fail. Let's learn from our failures, but be confident enough that it doesn't matter if you win. It really matters if you are trying your hardest. So I don't know that this one I'm nailing yet, but I'm trying. <laughs> I feel like you know, we grow up and we spend so much time attaching confidence to wins, but that's just unsustainable. We did an episode called This One's for the Dads, which was about how fatherhood is changing and has changed a lot. And we had a great story from Glenn Henry about some of the lessons that he took away from his time parenting. Here's a clip. It's hard to teach a baby how to do anything, but because the process automatically slows you down when you have a child. You're forced to be patient. You're forced to listen and hear sounds that you're not used to hearing. You're forced to anticipate someone's desires and needs. It really teaches you how to love people better. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind through any struggle as you're parenting. It's something that you get so much benefit from as well. Another thing I took away from this episode came from the expert Brian Anderson. Talking about community, and it it really got me thinking about a lot of my friends who have also become parents, and when we get together, we have sort of very surfacey conversations, what you been doing, how's the, you know, your yard, or like um, kids being crazy. We don't have the real conversations we used to have when we would spend time together before children. We're all so busy that it's hard to take those moments, but coming out of this, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make the extra effort when I'm around my friends and really try to get into the real stuff, not even about parenting, about like, or at least about how it's affecting them, my peers, and less about like, how's your son doing with reading? Mm, Uh, Yeah. Because that sense of community is so important. This role as parents is all about growth. And that's what I've really taken away from, honestly, all of the episodes, but this one in particular. Everything I learned in this next episode, I have applied probably a hundred times. It is the episode of what to say when your kids say, it's not fair. Mm. And this comes up daily, multiple times in our house. So the mom that shared her experience in parenting story of the day, Katie Cloyd, it gives us an idea of why this isn't such a terrible phrase after all, that there might be a silver lining. Take a listen. If I get snappy with my kids and they snap back at me, I really feel as a parent that I can't go, you're going to talk to me with respect. Well, because I didn't model that behavior. That wasn't fair. So I I try to make sure that I'm like, okay, you're not just my child. You are another member of this household. And so if I'm treating you unfairly, you tell me. You tell me that it's not fair. And I can't just always bristle at that. Like when my kids say, that's not fair. I can't always go, well, life's not fair. That's not a realistic way to treat my children either because when they are not here, in my home and somebody speaks to them, comes at them sideways, I want them to say, excuse me, that's not fair. I want them to learn to advocate for themselves and create their own sense of fairness and equality in their life. And I have to start that here. So the way that this comes up and manifests itself on the daily is down to like how big a cookie is compared to the other one or how much yeah. time they get to spend in the car with me because I drop one son off before another. And so it's it's not fair. You get more time with mom. So instead of just constantly fighting it, I've now looked at it and my son said that the other day as I was about to drop him off. He's like, it's not fair that Ryder gets to spend more time with you. I turned around rather than being like, well, that's, that's life. It's not fair. I looked at him and I was just like, oh, 
oh, that just must not feel great. I'm glad you said something. Maybe we can find some time this afternoon where you and I can do something because it sounds like you need a little bit more time with me. And I think it was like, oh, what? Yeah, oh, maybe I okay. maybe I should be advocating for myself. And that was the whole takeaway for me is this is just an example of our kids advocating for themselves and, and standing up for themselves. And I think it teaches kids also to not just be short-sighted on the situation. Like, yes, the cookie is a little bit of a different size, but to look outward and be like, I know you didn't get the bigger piece now. Here's what we can do to make that better. I think that helps them to have a wider view on everything. And that makes everything seem less of a dire situation to really lose mm-hmm. your mind over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I promise you, when you go back and listen to this episode, we touched on a few of the golden nuggets in it, but there's so many other wise pieces of advice from both our expert and our parent. And it's just something that I think will really help you in a phrase that I guarantee you, you have to deal with every single day. <laughs> I'm with you on it. If you don't, share with us some of your tips. It's not fair how good that episode is. <laughs> And that is the show and the season. That's the season, yes. That's the season. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the ride with us. And I want to thank all of our brilliant yet so down-to-earth experts and also parents who shared their knowledge, their experience, and so many inspiring stories. And as always, we want to thank you for listening. I'm going to miss you, but it's not for long. We're not going away. We're just taking a break. We're working on more exciting stuff for the next season. We're going to have even more information you can use right away to improve your parenting life. Yeah, and we really do make an effort to make it feel different. In one way that I really love is rather than sort of scolding parents, Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of parental advice is like, well, if you do this, you're in big trouble. It's like we've talked about with how we want to talk to our kids, like finding a positive way. It's not about Mm -hmm. being bad at something. It's about, well, maybe if you tried this, it might be a little bit better. So it's a much more positive way of looking at parenting. And that's something I have really tried to take in in my life from from working on this. And this stuff is easy to do. I, I think if you listen back on season three, the suggestions are simple, and that's the key. So don't go far, and don't forget to listen to our other podcast with your kids. It's called Stroller Coaster Storytime. Justin, tell us about that. Yes, this is our podcast where we take classic children's stories and update them with improv actors who perform them for you. It's always fun. You can find it in the same feed. We have a ton of great episodes. Please check them out. And how many podcasts can you listen to with your kids? We hope that you enjoyed this season as much as we've enjoyed spending the time with you. And if you did, share it with your friends. Also, share it with new parents. I look at it as a gift. It's been a gift to me. And even like new grandparents, it's something that they can do to learn what their children are going through and how they can best support them. So share away. Stroller Coaster is the gift that keeps on giving. And as always, thank you to Munchkin. No wonder they're the most loved baby brand in the world. You can find all of your favorite Munchkin products at munchkin.com. At Stroller Coaster, we're all about community. If you have a question or a topic that you want to hear more about next season, don't hesitate to reach out to us at podcast at munchkin.com. Before we go, Munchkin invites you to join us in helping make the planet a better place for our kids. Support organizations that protect animals and their natural habitat, like IFA, the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And now that you're ready to do something for the planet, here's something you can do for yourself. Take a time out. Let's journey to the lush valleys and alpine lakes of the Colorado mountains. Better known for its populations of moose and deer, this sprawling natural wonder is being reinstated as home to the spectacular gray wolf. After years of being overhunted and risking extinction, defender groups are actually physically returning gray wolves to their chosen habitat. Colorado has ample prey and habitat to sustain wolves, and with state residents adding to that support, we're well on our way to seeing wolves restored to the beautiful Colorado landscape.